Thank you, Peter, for inviting me to participate in uh, Grand Rounds and discuss advanced Venus imaging. So IVIS has become the most significant imaging modality to evaluate pelvic veins. It allows for the intraluminal evaluation of veins and more accurately evaluates stenotic vein lesions compared to conventional venography. IVIS evaluates variable diameter of the interrogated iliac veins. It confirms the iliac stenosis, as you can see in this series of images where the normal caliber of the vein is present. And as you move the catheter, you move into the stenotic area demonstrated by a decreased surface of um, the vein. More importantly, IVIS allows for precise deployment of venous stents across stenotic lesions. It has become indeed a game changer. Published reports from CVR and CVM indicate that pelvic venous disorders may be treated solely by the stenting of iliac vein stenosis without gonadal vein embolization. As clinicians, we may well ask, if an iliac vein stenosis is diagnosed, do we need further imaging? My charge today is to demonstrate the state of the art in venous imaging and convince you that imaging does have a role in specific situations. This is an image from a routine gonadal vein embolization case I was involved with. The uh, woman had classic symptoms of pelvic venous disorders. The pelvic varices were confirmed with transvaginal ultrasound and we proceeded with the case. You can see the sheath has been um, brought to the level of the proximal left gonadal vein. And when we passed the wire, we saw the wire take this 360 degree turn, go distally. And at that point, the patient experienced significant left flank pain. So we wonder, where's the wire? Do we continue? Do you step back? Do you get imaging? And if so, which study? Today's presentation will cover imaging modalities. We will discuss pelvic venous dilatation, insufficiency and obstruction, discuss the SVP classification of pelvic venous disorders, discuss lower extremity venous insufficiency aside from evaluation with ultrasound, and discuss the role of venous imaging to guide interventions. The Presentation will last approximately uh, 40 minutes, hopefully giving everybody time to get back to their clinical duties. Ultrasound provides real-time dynamic imaging and is broadly available in all centers. The advantage is that there's no radiation and the criteria for an abnormality are pelvic varices with a diameter greater than four millimeters, slow blood flow, dilated arcuate vein in the myometrium that communicates with pelvic varices, reversal of blood flow, direction in gonadal veins. However, the anatomic and patient factors may obscure optimal visualization. Multi-detector contrast enhanced CT or CT venography um, is used when a structural abnormality is suspected. Isotrophic CT databases, which means that the entire volume of the body part being interrogated is acquired, and this allows for robust post-processing capabilities. Multiplanar reformation allows image creation in any 2D plane, and volume rendering allows image creation in three dimensions. There's a wide information bandwidth, which I, by which I mean that the anatomy around the vessels being interrogated are also explicitly displayed. However, it does not provide information on flow direction. MRI or MRV uses image sequences optimized for pelvic anatomy, as well as dynamic vascular evaluation. Protocols used to evaluate the gonadal vein reflux and pelvic venous anatomy include high temporal 
resolution dynamic time resolved MRN geography. Quite a mouthful for 7 a.m. But however, this basically means that the flow in the vessels being interrogated are seen as in conventional angiography. Phase contrast MRI detects flow direction. And the databases also allow for robust 2D and 3D post-processing techniques. In my opinion, given availability and local expertise, MRI, including time-resolved MRA, is the preferred non-invasive method. Let's move on to the causes of abnormal pelvic dilatation. Pelvic venous insufficiency is due to incompetent or absent gonadal vein valves. Chronic venous distension, such as pregnancy or weightlifters, is also a cause. And the second major cause is obstruction, the left renal vein compression syndrome, the iliac vein compression, congenital or required absence of the IVC, or extrinsic compression from an abdominal pelvic mass or lymphadenopathy. This is a graphic representation of obstructive uh, causes from a lecture from Dr. Uh, Fedor Lori, and you can see that the obstruction is at the left renal vein or at the iliac veins. When we add the reflux causes, they involve the gonadal veins and also the lower extremity veins via as pelvic escape points. The complexity of the pelvic venous anatomy is evident in this even in this simplified schematic. Note the gonadal veins draining separately into the IVC and left renal vein. The complexity of the internal iliac vein branches. And note the communication of the pelvic veins to the lower extremities. The SVP classification was published in 2021 by a cohort of international authors from different medical subspecialties to provide a uniform language for pelvic venous disorders. This instrument characterizes a patient's clinical presentation in terms of symptoms, signs, and underlying pathophysiology. It defines a homogeneous patient group. It facilitates clinical communication allows for precisely direct, di directed treatment, allows for the development of patient reported outcome measures, and allows for the development of clinical trials. The abdomen, pelvis, and upper portion of the lower extremity are divided into four anatomic zones. Zone one includes the left renal vein, zone two includes the gonadal and internal iliac veins with pelvic venous varices. Zone three includes pelvic origin, extra pelvic veins, and zone four is lower extremity veins. Each zone has three domains, symptoms, variceal reservoirs, and pathophysiology, which in turn is subdivided into three subdomains, anatomy, hemodynamic abnormalities, and etiology. The clinical symptoms of pelvic venous disorders are related to the venous reservoirs that are affected. Left renal vein reservoir yields flank pain, hematuria, which are worsened with standing, sitting, or walking. When the pelvic reservoir is involved, there is pain, dyspareunia, and dysuria. When the lower extremity reservoir is affected, you see non saphenous varicose veins and leg symptoms. Complete classification using this scoring sheet ideally should be done after diagnostic imaging studies are complete. The SVP instrument attempts to comprehensively describe a patient's clinical presentation by the nomenclature of SVP and the corresponding subscripts. This busy chart has expanded text for each of the elements of the domains and helps 
in filling out the scoring sheet to repeat that domains are symptoms, varices, pathophysiology, which are then divided into anatomy, hemodynamics, and etiology. ABLS has developed an app named SVP Classifier for the Android and Apple platform that can be downloaded at this site. The Society has also released workbooks to practice using this classification. All right, let's move on to some cases. Transverse and transvaginal duplex and grayscale ultrasound images shown here with the uterus marked as an antrix with the asterisk shows dilated left parauterine vessels measuring greater than four millimeters in diameter. An oblique transverse, an oblique transabdominal duplex image shows reverse flow in the left gonadal vein at the level of the renal vein. Don't be fooled by the red color because when you look at the color scheme, red means that the blood is flowing away and as such refluxing. These are some references for ultrasound assessment of pelvic venous reflux that you may peruse at your leisure. This is a MRI findings of a 40 year old a woman. MR angiograms are obtained at 28 seconds, 33 seconds and 43 seconds after contrast injection showing reflux of contrast into the left gonadal vein, then filling the pelvic varices, uterine arcuate veins, allow blood to cross over to the right pelvic varices, and also note the uh, perineal varicosities. The coronal and axial images also show the pelvic left parauterine varices. Dynamic time-resolved MI angiography movie loop of the same patient beautifully demonstrates the flow of contrast down the dilated left gonadal vein, the filling of the pelvic varices, as well as the vulvar varices. This is a cine loop of a 3D volume rendered CTV of the patient that I demonstrated at the beginning. Notice that this movie loop exquisitely demonstrates the dilated gonadal veins, the 360 degree loop in the left gonadal vein, as well as multiple branches of the right gonadal vein that will need to be embolized. I think an image like this, when shown to the patient, uh, conveys exactly what we're doing and also facilitates the planning both in time and equipment that the embolization case will take. This is again, an image of the wire as demonstrated previously. A catheter has been passed distally into the gonadal vein and a soft long nester coil is being pushed by a guide wire to be deployed distally into the gonadal vein. This is further embolization. And you can see as we straighten out the gonadal vein and the wires push the coils and we eventually pack the gonadal vein a puff of contrast via the sheath shows lack of reflux down the gonadal vein and the coils are stable away from the level of the renal vein. Subsequent uh, cases we'll use uh, will be from these two references that show exquisite anatomy. Left renal vein compression syndrome relates to the patency of the left renal vein in the angle between the aorta and the SMA. In the normal situation, the area in this angle is spacious. In the compression syndrome, the angle is narrow, compressing the left renal vein. 
A 22-year-old woman presented with left flank pain, microscopic hematuria, and progressive left lower quadrant pain. The axial CT image shows compression of the left renal vein, the white arrowhead, by the SMA and the aorta. The sagittal image shows the left renal vein, the black arrowhead, in the narrow space between the SMA and the aorta. The sagittal image shows a varicosity around the ureter, and the axial CT of the pelvis shows the pelvic varicosities. The scoring sheet has already been filled, and I will not go through it, and it yields this SVP classification, which is rather intimidating, but I want you to look at these like a sentence to be read from left to right. And here, the symptoms are in the renal and pelvic uh, region. The varicosities are again in the renal and pelvis. There is left renal vein obstruction, non-thrombotic, and the left gonadal vein shows reflux, non-thrombotic. Dynamic MR angiogram sequence of a left renal vein compression syndrome is demonstrated in this case. Note the dilated left renal vein being pinched off at the level of the superior mesenteric artery and the aorta. And the coronal image shows similarly the attenuation of the left renal vein over the aorta, the dilated left renal vein, and reflux down the left gonadal vein to the pelvic varices. In the may Thurner syndrome, there's compression of the left common iliac vein between the right common iliac artery and the anterior surface of the underlying vertebral body, resulting in left pelvic and left lower extremity venous congestion. The coronal view of this CTV demonstrates the right common iliac artery over the left common iliac vein and the axial image shows the compression of the left common iliac vein by the right common iliac artery. A 45-year-old man presented with acute left lower extremity pain, swelling and skin discoloration following a long distance flight. In this axial image, the white arrow indicates the right common iliac artery compressing the left common iliac vein the black arrow. The hypodense region is seen better in the coronal view where the thrombosis of the left common iliac vein and left external iliac vein is demonstrated. Again, the scoring sheet has been filled out. And if we read the SVP classification as the symptoms involving the leg, there are no varicosities. There is left common iliac vein obstruction, thrombotic in nature, and there's also left external iliac vein obstructive and thrombotic in nature. This is uh, another case uh, of this uh, woman with varices in the medial aspect of her left leg that arise high in the perineum. There's associated pelvic uh, labial varices, excuse me. This is uh, another case where the sagittal MR image demonstrates a tangle of abnormal pelvic varicosities leading to a large draining vein that runs down to the varicosity seen in the medial aspect of the leg. This axial image again demonstrates the varicosities in the medial left leg. Selective angiogram of the obturator vein during Valsalva maneuver shows contrast flow down this large draining vein and draining into the leg. This is the SVP classification that I will let you go through. The last case shows one of the four pelvic leak points from the internal iliac veins to the lower extremity veins and are demonstrated in this sagittal view and in this view from the inferior aspect of the pelvis. The leak points are the inguinal 
obturator, perineal, and gluteal horns. So let's move on to other conditions that may fool one in thinking that there's pelvic venous disorders which have different etiologies and may serve as pitfalls. An 18 year old woman presented with bilateral leg swelling and pain, a 3D reconstruction CT venogram demonstrates these enlarged abdominal wall varices. You can see a dilated left gonadal vein, associated pelvic varices, and then draining into an enlarged left renal vein. In the region of the IBC, however, you see sparse veins, and this represents IVC attresia. An 80-year-old woman presented with similar symptoms of bilateral lower extremity edema and pain. She gave a history of having a DVT and the placement of an IVC filter. The coronal CT venogram demonstrates the filter, but also the thrombosed IVC and reflux via the gonadal veins with pelvic varices demonstrated by the asterisk. This represents chronic occlusion of the IVC. The final pitfalls of 30-year-old, 38-year-old woman with chronic pelvic pain. These are sequential MR angiograms at 13 seconds and 18 seconds after contrast injection. Noticed the early filling of this tangle of vessels which represent arteries and the drainage away from this tangle via this enlarged vein. Notice that the IVC fills in early and that there is absence of dilated gonadal veins. And this case represents a pelvic arterial venous malformation. So we've covered imaging modalities, pelvic venous dilatation, and SVP classification of pelvic venous disorders. Let me now deal with two final topics, lower extremity venous insufficiency and venous imaging used to guide interventions. This is a 76 year old man, laborer his entire life, presented with pain, heaviness, and swollen ankles. Varicose veins, skin pigmentation changes, and bleeding ulcers are present. Trying to perform an ultrasound through this thickened skin and with the lesions was impossible. So we brought this patient and performed a CTV of the lower extremities. These are sequential images with the skin dialed in, the skin dialed away, and you can see the hypoplastic gonadal vein, the bone calcification in the femoral artery. And remember that CT is based on density. So we can dial in and dial out densities of soft tissues, contrast or bone. This is at the region of the knee demonstrating extensive collaterals and finally down at the ankle showing extensive venous tributaries. This is a cine loop that, again, we create a 3D model that can be rotated and evaluated in multiple projections, enhancing our ability to map out the abnormalities and then plan appropriate treatment. Unfortunately, this patient uh, was, did not come back for treatment and was lost to follow-up. My final topic is a plug for interventional radiologists, or for that matter, vascular surgeons who performed endovascular procedures. On the previous Grand Rounds, one of our fellows, Aditi Malhotra, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name, presented a beautifully detailed case of extensive leg DVT sent to the hospital for thrombolysis and stent placement. At the hospital, the patient underwent uh, 
successful stent placement and was performed by a interventional radiologist. However, a vascular surgeon may well have performed this procedure. And with increasing technology, the roles of each of these subspecialists that play in the care of a vascular patient has become blurred. I thought I'd just share two interesting cases from my previous professional life as a full-fledged card-carrying interventional radiologist at a tertiary care level one trauma center. And the tagline for Interventional Radiology Society is the vision to heal. In other words, we use imaging to direct our treatment. This is a case of a 23-year-old admitted to the ICU with seizures who developed left leg DVT. Sequential images from a CT demonstrate the placement of the filter in the IVC, but I draw attention to this structure to the left of the aorta, a coronal CT images, and I'll slow this down a bit, again shows the IVC filter, but I draw attention to the, this structure that represents the left-sided portion of a duplicated IVC. So as such, this filter is not protecting the patient from emboli from the lower extremities. And a decision was made to place a suprarenal IVC filter. This is the second filter, more craniad. And notice that the tip of the filter is at the T10, T11 disk space. A follow-up KUB, a very astute diagnostic radiologist noticed that the filter compared to when it was placed has migrated caudally. A CT was performed and coming down, you notice the filter, the cranial filter, and notice that the tines are extending into the renal arteries. Here we see the lower filter and the coronal view also demonstrates the tines of the filter extending into the renal veins. Again, this patient is not being protected from potential emboli from the lower extremities. So this filter, the cranial filter needed to be retrieved. Notice that on contrast injection of the IVC, the more caudal filter has indeed trapped a thrombus, an embolism. The craniat filter was snared, was pulled into the sheath and successfully delivered out of the body. So at this point to protect the patient, we did a venogram of the left portion of the duplicated IVC and placed a filter, thereby protecting any possible emboli. Again, I think that all the imaging led to this successful thought process to protect the patient. My final case is a complication of venous access devices. And there's a condition called the catheter pinch-off syndrome where there's catheter fatigue at the costoclavicular junction and the, the distal portion of the catheter may break off as in this case that you see the distal broken off fragment sitting in the right atrium. I was asked if we could retrieve this filter and I proceeded approaching from the inferior aspect of the IVC. But as I was advancing my catheters and wires, this catheter disappeared from my blood fluoroscopic screen. At that point, there's a huge sinking feeling knowing that this catheter could only have migrated through the heart, possibly into the pulmonary arteries. And indeed, you see the catheter in a pulmonary artery in the left lower lobe. At this point, one has to think very quickly and trying to grasp this catheter through the ventricle, right ventricle, could possibly cause significant arrhythmias, plus the 
pulmonary arteries probably in spasm around this fragment. So how do you grab this filter from the, this fragment from the outside? Pretty tough. However, this is a catheter that has a lumen and you can potentially grab it from the inside. I advanced a guide wire and over the guide wire, a filter, in, um, a balloon catheter and inflated the balloon catheter and gently pulled back out of the pulmonary artery, out of the heart. At some point, I would have to pull the fragment through my access sheath and deflate the balloon. So I put in a snare to bind down the fragment and successfully it pulled out the catheter. It was quite a fun case. Again, a nerve wracking case, but imaging allowed me to resolve the clinical dilemma. So in conclusion, my recommendations are to look at all the imaging studies that you order, persuade your radiology department to provide state of the art in imaging, and to find an IR or a vascular surgeon committed to your standard of excellence, you will find that particularly interventional radiologists are very user-friendly. I wanna thank you for your attention and thank Dr. Pappas for continuing to encourage me to think about pelvic interventions and pelvic disease. And also my colleagues, Dr. Gurav Lakampal and Rick Kennedy from the Center for Vascular Medicine. Thank you. I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Fernando. It was always a very stimulating talk. So anybody have any questions for Dr. Leskis? All right. So happy Good Friday for those of you celebrating. Happy, you know, Passover for all our, our Jewish friends. And everybody enjoy the weekend. Thank you, Fernando. And happy Easter next week, Peter. Thank you. Christos Anesti. That's right. I'll give you an early Christos Anesti. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Take care. Take care, guys. Bye.